What up, and thanks for joining me again for another edition of Zach Miller Says. We got Jay Myers in this episode. We talk about three things. Well, we talk about a lot more than three things, but three big takeaways. Number one, how do you build for the future? Number two, how to cope with the roadblocks. And finally, Trace, being transparent and how it helps others. Jay Myers is from Memphis, super rad dude, also an author. We talk about that. And much more. Let's get into the show right now. All right, Jay, you're a huge baseball fan. I'm going to start with the toughest question of all. Who is your favorite baseball player of all time? Mickey Mantle. Why? Well, I think that he was obviously incredibly talented, and switch hitter, he hit a ton of home runs. But I also admired the fact that he, you know, at the end of his career, he's playing with a lot of pain. So he, he, he you know, kind of was had a lot of perseverance. And then I'm one of those people that actually likes the fact, you know, admired that, he, you know, he admitted he's a flawed character and, you know, that uh, he, he did some wonderful things in the baseball field. But he had some other things that, you know, later in life he kind of regretted. But uh, he, in my opinion, he could have been the best that ever played the game had he stayed healthy. Oftentimes I've noticed that the fitness world, the sports world and business have a lot of overlap in the things that you have to do, you know, being very tenacious, get through rough times to get to the, the top stuff. Is there stuff that you look at in, in fitness and sports and baseball and use that in your business career? Oh, absolutely. So as an example, uh, Zach, many years ago, 2007, uh, I had a major crisis in my business. I wrote about it in my second book called Hitting the Curveballs. And Basically, what happened was I lost 80% of my sales team uh, to turnover, and, and it wasn't because I was a horrible guy. It was like one guy wanted to start his own business, one guy went to work for a customer, supplier, et cetera. But I had a decision to make about how we were going to deal with it, and as a team, we got together and, and, and talked about you know, building for the future, and, and how do you do that? And I came up with the kind of the analogy of the farm system, like they do in baseball, you get the the, the young talent in that you can develop over time. And, you know, honestly, it's worked really well here. I mean, man, in 2007, we did about $11 million. And four years later in 2011, we did almost $25 million amidst the worst economy in 80 years. So we believe in the farm system. No, I love that analogy. And I think that's, that's really strong. What type of business is it? So interactive solutions, we do sell them install video conferencing and audio visual systems telemedicine distance learning um so it's a technology firm you know based here in memphis got an office in nashville and east tennessee and we we sell and install this stuff all across the country very cool very cool what is as technology has changed over the years obviously video conferencing is something that we're doing right now but it's something that allows people to build relationships and have conversations with people that, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 years ago were non-existent, uh, were mm. non-existent. And so where, where do you think the, the next phase of this is going? You know, because 30 years ago, if you weren't next to that person or you didn't have their phone number, you couldn't do it. Now you can basically talk to whoever you want, whenever you want, wherever they are. What is kind of the next phase coming through? Well, I think that, you know, the, the uh, technology has grown tremendously since I started my, my career in, in video conferencing, which actually predated my uh, ISI and interactive solutions. But I think the exciting part today is that the, the technology has gotten to a, a point that it, it keeps getting better and better and more user friendly than ever before. The development software based solutions, products like Zoom and these other type of products, um, I think will be definitely the, the near future, you know, down the road. I mean, I, I could see people having video conferencing and, and software in their house and making it convenient from anywhere to, to, to link up as a network. So can maximize that. Um, I think it's not going to be just talking heads and things, but it's, uh, you're going to be able to do some high level collaboration, whether it be with, you know, databases to what have you, um, so, you know, it's the stuff like that I think is going to be out there. The other thing, just kind of a derivative of video conferencing, but, you know, you know, we outfit a lot of conference rooms, and one of the things we're working on is to make the user experience better. 
And so the way that we're looking at that is for them not to have to hit buttons, but literally to walk in a room and with voice commands off Alexa, get it, launch a video call. And then in tandem with that, when they walk in the room, we're working on smart conference rooms that'll, with beacons that allow uh, you know, the, the, the people that are managing the network to know who's coming in the conference room, wh- how long they stayed, everything electronically, um, and, and kind of like uh, you know, uh, a tracking system, if you will. Th- those are really, uh, those are things out there. Um, I also see the software-based solutions on video conferencing to be uh, growing significantly in healthcare as these healthcare institutions and hospitals and rural locations are looking for lower cost ways to connect from the small town and wherever it is to the specialist in, in the major city. That's a big part of our market right now with telemedicine, but frankly, I see a lot more growth as the price of this equipment and software has come down. Yeah, it's it, the convenience is ridiculously nice compared to what you had to do years ago. So right. two books... Do you like one more than the other? No, that's actually like picking your, you know, I've got two kids, so I don't think I need to pick the favorite of that. But I, um, I will say this much. My first book keeps swinging. Um, I guess the entrepreneur story of overcoming adversity and achieving small business success. It was a very, very personal type of, it didn't read like, doesn't read like any other business book that you've ever read because it's more of like a personal account of uh, life and business events that, that you know, I was kind of speaking from my heart. Um, so there weren't things like you typically see in business books, the tips to do this, to do that, you know, that kind of thing. So more of like a uh, memoir? Yeah, almost. I mean, I didn't really feel like I was worthy enough professionally to do that. I, I'm not that interesting. But what was interesting and the, kind of the, the core centerpiece of the book was dealing with an embezzlement that we had in my business. And, uh, this has been a long time ago, but my accounting manager stole a quarter of a million dollars from us. And we had to deal with the emotions of that. And it was a real rough time for me personally, Zach. I uh, just lost my brother, dropped dead out of nowhere. And, um, you know, it, it was difficult to even envision surviving that whole uh, incident. But, you know, it keeps swinging. I don't want to spoil the story for your listeners, but. Uh, I will just politely say uh, justice prevailed and we did prosecute and you need to read the rest of the story to see how we did it. It's pretty interesting. Um, I will say that particular issue, if you could see my office back behind me, but there we've gotten tremendous, ridiculous publicity about the embezzlement situation to the point the Wall Street Journal did literally like a full page article on us in the small business section. And, uh, they had me on Fox News and all. It's crazy because, you know, it was a really you have to read the book to understand how crazy it was the way I had discovered it, but the way we dealt with it and it made a decent story. Um, but a painful experience. The second book was like <clears throat> basically derived after four years after the embezzlement. And I just kind of described the situation. But in, in book uh, number two, Hitting the Curveballs, How Crisis Can Strengthen and Grow Your Business. Uh, we did um, have a, another big time obstacle with um, having 80 percent of my sales team leave the company in the summer of 2007. And as I told you um, earlier there, you know, th- th- we, we developed the farm system, uh, hired a bunch of millennials and they took the business from 11 to 25 million dollars in the worst economy in 80 years. I thought that was a story worth telling. And the second book does go into more of like, here's what's worked for us. So kind of like tips. I end uh, every chapter with stepping up to the plate and it's specific advice that I would give about dealing with certain issues. Everything wasn't about that crazy summer. It was, there's other things in there about um, not growing broke, uh, you know, uh, talking about plateau or grow. I mean, just different issues you run into with a small business. Love it. A lot to hit on here. Okay, so um, 80% sales turnover in one summer. Is that what it was, you said? That's correct. So were there any signs that that was going to happen? Like what Like what? What was the reasoning? You said one guy went and started his own business, but like why did it keep happening? Were you, were you not kind of 
um, fertilizing the uh, the ballpark, if you will, like <laughs> trying to you know stick with those you know baseball analogies. But like, I mean, 80 percent is a lot. Yeah. Yeah, Zach, I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I think that it's uh, one of the guys that have been with me nine years. He was always entrepreneurial. And I think that, you know, nine years is a long time in, in sales and, and in technology. They're like dog years. So times seven. Um, the other fellow had been with us about five or six years. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Um, and then the, the other folks, an equal amount of time. You know, this industry and in audio, visual and video conferencing, it can be very draining to keep up with things. You know, in the case of salespeople to post numbers every year, it, it, it takes a lot out of you. And um, I will tell you for those guys that left, you know, it, it's interesting. I just um, I just wrote an article for an industry magazine called System Contractor News, and I'm looking at it on my desk and it, the title of the article, uh, they actually changed the title I came up with, but essentially it was Make Deals, Not War or essentially don't burn bridges. And we probably had a good reason to burn the bridges with some of those guys back in 07, but we chose not to. Certainly we were disappointed, traumatized and everything else, but we chose not to. Um, and we ended up buying product from the guy that had the startup company. The other sales guy is uh, works to this day for one of our biggest suppliers at Cisco. Another guy is a customer uh, at one of our biggest accounts. So it's been a friendly thing since then. You know, turnover is part of business. It, it's going to happen. I don't care what kind of business you're in. Yeah, I think the stat is people leave a business every two and a half years or something like that. That's the average. So yeah. you hitting almost a decade on some of these folks. Those are good numbers. Yeah. So I'm a big believer in building relationships, definitely not burning bridges and everything like that. But in that time of crisis, in the time of, um, negativity or that you really want to burn that bridge. How do you, how do you cope with that roadblock? How do you make sure that you don't actually screw up a scenario because in 10 years you, you still might be able to work with that person in some capacity like you have? Well, I mean, one of the things that helped me a lot was, and this is kind of management 101 was I, I kind of went back, uh, to my team to talk through what had happened and, to get their advice about how to deal with it. I was taking those guys leaving us very personally, you know, they were leaving me and that, you know, all this kind of thing. I think when we kind of made the transition from it, not being an, an I problem, but a we problem, then that was the way we kind of bridged the gap to, to make the, um, you know, the transition. And that's just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, management. I listen to your people. Uh, they were telling, give me great feedback and, Everybody wanted to build the, uh, the business for the future, and nobody wanted to see these guys take us down. So, um, and through the years, I mean, and even at that time, that one, of, one of my guys, uh, to, to kind of get to answer your question a little bit more on point, one of my guys uh, turned around to me, he said, guy, he said, think about this. He said, the guy that had the startup business and then the other guy with the supplier and so on, he says, think about it. He says, you can have the value of them in terms of buying product or offering leads or whatever uh, uh, manufacturer support, you can have the value of those guys without having them on your payroll. And, and that kind of made me kind of get level set. How, how so in that case? Like what, how, how, how do you have their skill set but not on payroll? How does that work? Well, in the case of like the, the guy that started his own business, he had a, a business of does that, that he, uh, you know, makes or manufactures a, a streaming and recording solution that we needed for our clients. It was lower cost, had a really uh, competitive spot in the market and didn't burn the bridge uh, and used this individual, his equipment. And then, you know, through the years, leads and things on different accounts. I mean, there, there, we didn't, we could have burned the bridge, but we didn't. And with this, another guy, uh, again, work, went to work for a major supplier at Cisco you know, it's kind of funny. I think he actually has been kind of guilt ridden for a little while and he felt like, you know, he kind of dropped the bomb on us. And since that time, so we're 11 years later, this guy couldn't have done any more to support us from the manufacturer standpoint of Cisco. And he's provided us leads and helped us close business. And so, you know, you, you got a choice to make, man. I mean, it, you know, you, you have to, 
to look at, I think, uh, for all your listeners who own small businesses and everything, you have to look at the big picture and you have to look at the runway that's in front of you. You can't make the decision for today. You need to make the decision for tomorrow and the future. Very, very powerful. What book was first? What book was first? Keep swinging. Okay, so keep swinging. That's more of the memoir. Yeah, and then getting the yes. Okay. So, when did you know that you wanted to write a book, or when did you know that you wanted to write Keep Swinging? Yeah, um, yeah, great question. So. Uh, not to spoil the whole thing, but the f- first chapter is titled The Courtroom, and it's when I was in federal court with my uh, wife and sitting outside the courtroom and waiting for the sentencing of this accounting manager and the federal judge. This is for the and embezzlement case? That's correct. Yeah. And I uh, I just, you know, I, I was so um, emotional about the thing. I remember putting my head down, you know, like, between my knees or whatever, and, you know, just started thinking about all this stuff that had happened to us besides the embezzlement to get us to where we were that day. And I just thought those were stories. And, you know, I I had something to say um, about overcoming adversity. I felt like that by writing about it, it could be kind of cathartic. It's a very personal book. You know, the second one is more, like I mentioned earlier, if, if you made me pick a favorite book, I'll just say this. Let me let me give you a real answer on that. <clears throat> if you made me pick a favorite book, you know, the first one's always special, but I did have a collaborator help me with that one. So the second book was just me. So I guess I'm going to have to say that I'm going to go with the second book, but they're both special. So a, a collaborator like a ghostwriter or? No, no, not really. I mean, we just kind of swapped, uh, you know, information. I'd write up some stuff. He'd write up some stuff. I send audio files, wave files you know, things that were on my mind to put in there. So we, we collaborated. He, um, it was a good situation. I'd never written a book before and I wanted, uh, to, to have somebody that you know was a professional writer to help me. And this guy, Darren Dahl used to work for Inc magazine. And, uh, you know, he really wanted to try to do an article of in ink on, on the embezzlement and they chose not to. So he emailed me one day and said, let's tackle a book together. So we, we did it together. I mean, it was, uh, and, and Darren has reach with a lot of other people. He's uh, since he helped me write Keep Swinging, he's helped I don't know how many authors you know collaborate on books, bunch. Yeah, I know with my book, it's, I wrote it. People that you know ask me how long did it take me to write, and I, and I'll ask you this question in a second. But the answer is basically five weeks. It's about fifty five thousand words. I had it all in my head. It was basically based on a webinar that I had done a million times before. And I just spent two weeks on, and then I took a few weeks off, and then I had three weeks on. But then it was a bunch of other people touching it, giving me feedback, you know, editors doing this and that. And I think it's made it a lot more, uh, it's made it stronger. And it sounds like with Darren, that's something that uh, has been ben- beneficial for you. So once you started writing to kind of getting to that kind of first edit, how many weeks do you think that was, or how, how long of a time frame? <laughs> how many, how many well, years? <laughs> I'm not as yeah. I was getting ready to say I'm not as talented as you are. Oh, Zach. I would, I'm not talented. I just wanted to get it done. Well, I, I I wanted to get it done as well, but I wanted to get it done right. Right. And I made a million mistakes with that first book and not getting a professional editor to help me. And you know, I did do the right thing by getting Darren to help and everything. But um, it took a while. I mean, I'd say probably since the end of '06, the book came out a year later. So I'd say everything in between that. It probably took 11 months. Easy. Um, so that came out in 07, you said, right? That's correct. When um, um, Hitting the curveball, what year was that? That that was 2014. Uh, okay. And that was, um, I'd say, probably at least a year's process. Yeah. Is uh, Morgan um, James on both? Yes, sir. Got it. I think they just hit 15 years. They did, yeah. It's great. Uh, very proud of David. Oh yeah, it's it's wonderful. So, before we pressed record, you said, "I hope you're not trying to make money on your book." Mm-hmm. So, knowing now that you are 11, 12 years later on your first book, do you feel that way? Like, what what has been what looking back 11, 12 years, like what has been the benefit of having a book in your arsenal? Well, I'd say this to you and all your listeners. It's, it's completely changed my professional life. 
I mean, I've taken a lot of pride in building my business and doing these kind of things. And we've got an industry and, you know, Inc. Magazine recognition and all that kind of stuff. But writing the books has been the most professionally uh, rewarding thing I've ever done. And it's it's really kind of redefined me um, with my industry and with just I have a whole group of contacts that come from my books that know something about my business, but know more about the books and everything. It's very rewarding to get the the emails and the personal notes saying they were inspired by stuff. I mean, I've lost count on the both books. So people are talking about that they, you know, up at two and three in the morning reading them. And you, you can't really put a price tag on it. I didn't go into it to make money because it's kind of a hard haul there. I'm not John Grisham, but on the other hand, um, because of the the content and I think people like the books and everything, it has positioned me very well to speak, um, you know, professional executive level stuff at um, a number of organizations. And I'm, I'm registered with the Executive Speakers Bureau and I'm invited to all these community places and everything that to speak. And it's it's primarily because I wrote those books. So that I don't think you put a price tag on that. And but I will tell you that speaking gigs do pay money. And, and so you can make money on that. And, and uh, but it was never my motivation, but it's come it's come about because of those books. Sure. So if you're listening and you want Jay Myers to come by and give your organization a talk, you know where to, where to find them. So yeah, s- someone listening that hears you say books don't make money. They're very rewarding in other ways. Yes, they can get you speaking gigs and stuff like that. I've always been taught, don't do things that don't make money, right? Publisher has told me, make sure, you know, that, I guess, what is it? The average book sells a thousand copies or something like that. It's not, it's not a lot. So all the numbers tell you you're not going to do it. So then how do you make money on something that you don't make money on? Well, that's a great question, Zach. I think that the uh, first book, and I think the second one as well, we use it as a marketing tool. So every employee, every customer, every prospect in our territory, which is about six or seven uh, states in the Southeast, uh, have, have a copy of my book. And if you want to monetize it, I'll just give you a very recent example that I need to tell David this over Morgan James, but I was invited to speak to an executive MBA class at the University of Memphis. And part of the whole backdrop, I always have copies of my books for the students and what have you. Well, come to find out that one of the students that actually wasn't there the day that I spoke, but heard about my presentation and and it was very favorable, invited me to lunch. And he was a chief information officer for, let's call it a Fortune 500 company in this local area that just executed a two and a half million dollar contract for me. So if you want to monetize, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot less books that you have to sell, right? When you, when you get that contract from there. So, um, yeah, that's, that's crazy. One of the things that I'm doing, uh, it sounds like you do it too, is, you know, if you want a client, you know, you can give them your, your book as a business card, handwritten card with it saying, Hey, here's this thing. Um, you know, does it cost money? Absolutely. But if they like what they read, who knows what could happen out of it? The worst thing that you lose is the time to write the card. A couple of bucks to do that and a couple of bucks for print. If you can make $2 million off of it, I mean, it sounds pretty lucrative to me. So, Yeah, I mean, my books have sold, uh, you know, and I've given away some and all this kind of stuff. I think currently I'm probably sitting somewhere around 20000 20, with the two books. So we've done way better than we thought we would. But um you know, when you look at it from a standpoint of you just mentioned something, I, and actually in the second book, I, I, you, you took a quote out of it because it's like I see books as being for at least business books, the way I wrote them, uh, you know, our best business card. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing that you could see in some collateral or data sheets or whatever that would tell our story any better than those two books because they're right from the heart. They're true stories. They're real life. And I, I think people... People seem to have responded to that really well. Yeah, transparency is, is, is very, very powerful. So the Executive Speakers Bureau, is that, is that what yes. it was? What is that? What is that? So it's a uh, Memphis-based firm, but they are um, they book speakers 
all across the country for a, a variety of events. I'm probably the least famous, most famous person on their list. They've got really some big names uh, that do a lot of the, uh, the speaking for them. And, uh, you know, if you're a baseball person from the old days, you might remember a guy named um, uh, Steve Garvey that played for the Dodgers. They, they, they book him. They I know you know this name, Zach. Uh, Dr. Jim Collins, good to great author. Uh, they booked him, and so they got a lot of people. I mean, I, I'm I'm the uh, ham and egger, but I I do ha- enjoy uh, the, they position me um, in several uh, uh, speaking engagements. But I will say this also: once you get out there in the books and the speaking, I, I, word of mouth, uh, I have more people come to me, you know, and just want me to speak at you know, name an event, a chamber of commerce, to what have you, Rotary or something. What's your favorite book? Is it Jim Collins' book? Uh, I would say <clears throat> there, there's actually, I'm going to kind of be a, a, a two part answer. Uh, there was a book by a guy named Doug Tatum called No Man's Land. And it's about the, and it's really interesting the way he wrote it about kind of like you have this momentum and sales growth and everything like that, but to reach the next level, there's like this gap. Uh, you know, so I think that's a really good book. The other one I like um, is uh, it's an old book by Andy Grove, the founder of, of Intel, and it's about uh, only the paranoid survive. And it's just such a, a, a you know powerful book and everything because in technology, you ha- I think he's right. You have to stay paranoid about what's coming. Uh, no man's land is that gap, you know, like this in between spot. With Doug Tatum's book that people like my business, small, you know, too big to be small and too small to be big and, you know, how to deal with all that. So I have this theory that obviously you're recommending a few books right now. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a book that I like in a second, but um, when you recommend a book, that person has to be going through basically the exact part of their life that they need to be to be reading that book for it to make a big impact. And so there's this book that um, I read maybe three, four months ago um, by Scott Jurek. Um, It's a guy who basically um, speed ran the Appalachian Trail in 46 days. And he kind of chronicles and documents the process. Half of the book is um, written and and spoken by him. And the other half is by his wife, who was what they call crew. So like she drives while he's running to the next stop. And what's interesting is... It's probably, I guess, a memoir, a life book, but it's so impactful if you can take little tidbits out of it and think about your career and life and business. And um, it was it was just very, very interesting to me. I've recommended it to several people and all of those people are in similar positions to me now in life and they all get it and love it. The ones who are not there in their kind of career yet don't love it as much. So have you ever seen anything like that where you have to kind of be in that sweet spot of, um, for a book to make a big impact for someone? Or do you, do you think my theory is crazy? No, I don't think your theory is crazy. I mean, I, you know, I think if I'm kind of analyzing things, I think that the attraction, at least for my books, you know, particularly, uh, the first one, but the second one as well is that people that are forget technology, forget small business, people that are dealing with adversity, I mean, of any nature, you know, personal and otherwise, um, you know, the, the thing I didn't tell you about that summer of 07, besides all those people leaving me, was that I, uh, that same summer, and and by the way, I didn't mention also of those 80% of my sales team, they all left in 30 days. And that was what was really particularly painful. But in, the, in that same 30 days, Zach, um, had a technician of mine go in the hospital for a liver transplant and never came out. Had a friend go on vacation to Gulf Shores, Alabama, and never came back. Saturday, Saturday funerals. And then on top of it, my wife had to deal with a major health crisis that, thank God, was dealt with. But it was just everything was hitting me at once. I mean, I remember <clears throat> being so traumatized by everything that I, I was afraid to turn the lights off in my bedroom. Because I, I was honestly afraid of what the next day was going to look like. So people, I think, whether it be that that book and hitting the or those uh, chapters and hitting the curveballs or in keep swinging, dealing with all the emotional 
uh, impact of not only the embezzlement, but the timing of the embezzlement. She started stealing from me a few days after my brother dropped dead out of nowhere. And I think people got in, you know, I never did it necessarily to inspire people, but I think that's what happened. And more importantly, you know, to never give up, you know, to keep pushing on and, you know, realize that with adversity, it can strengthen you. So being transparent, is that something that's a, a hard skill to learn? How has it helped you? Because it sounds like everything you're doing is being very transparent about very difficult scenarios. And right. internally, they're helping you. Um, but is that something that was hard to start or, or what? No, I mean, that's who I am. And I think that the people, the, the customers and the supplier, everybody got the books, I think appreciated just the straight talk. You know, that it was not some kind of political speak or whatever. And, you know, that speak from the heart. Zach, if you read the books, I don't write like uh, in the third person. It's in the first person. So it's it is you feel like whatever I'm going through, you're going through it with me. And I think that just resonated with people. I mean, honestly, I, you know, I've heard I mean, I've had some wonderful emails through the years. I keep a bunch of them. And it's just it's crazy that they read the book and, you know, they were having a tough time and they read the book and it made them feel better about moving forward. And, uh, you know, that if, if this guy can go through all that stuff he went through, then I can go through my stuff. And, you know, that, that that's such a rewarding, such a. Um, in an incredibly good feeling to have when, when people communicate that to you. Yeah. It's uh, I get a handful of those and they're not for the book yet, but for just helping people and, and through my podcast, yeah. stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's powerful. It is, it's, it's definitely powerful. So 07 for keep swinging and hitting the curveball in 14. When was the last time you read either of those? <laughs> That's funny. Um, I probably read Keep Swinging for a couple of years. I mean, I read it a couple of times. So 07, <clears throat> excuse me, to 09. And then uh, I have read Hitting the Curveballs, I guess a couple of times, but uh, some additional kind of neat wrinkle for Hitting the Curveballs. Uh, I worked out a, a, a deal with uh, Morgan James, the, our publisher, or my publisher, to um, uh, take advantage of being able to do an audio version. And so there's an audio version sitting uh, on hitting the curveballs that is really pretty neat. And I'm uh, going to be a proud papa when I say that, but the narrator is my son. And uh, so that was really very personal, very rewarding. That's cool. That's very cool. I, um, I'm going to be doing audio as well for mine. And um, has, has that, have you seen that audio has done better than the physical book or anything like that? Um, do people download that or listen more than they buy the physical book or, or the same with Kindle or, and eBooks? Yeah. You know, I mean, neither Kindle or, uh, nor the, uh, audio is, you know, sold as many as the print, but I will tell you, if you started doing kind of a market segment and you look at who bought the audio books, it's all younger people. They don't really want to read printed material, but they'll listen. And I would say, I mean, that I particularly, again, because my son and everything, but I love the print version. I think it's great, you know, and all that. But I really, I think it becomes even more powerful, the, the story, when you hear somebody, you know, speaking uh, like, and, and my son's done a lot of theater and everything. So he, he's, he's really good. I mean, I just have to say, and um, so it, it's been rewarding. No, n nowhere near the sales, uh, but it, I guess I have to say, kind of like the sex appeal of the audio is way more than the print. You know, it, it's, it's just, it's cool. It, it, it's interesting because <clears throat> what, what is allowed is you can get the conviction from the person telling it in a completely different way than when you're just consuming it um, by reading it. And there is, um, so I've been, I've been reading a lot and by reading, I mean, listening. Um, so I'll definitely get your audio of, of it and uh, I'm looking yeah. forward to it, but I have this waterproof iPod. So I swim a lot of laps uh, and then I ride my bike a lot. So it allows me when it's raining or in the pool, I can listen and to be able to hear some of these people's raw emotions go through these scenarios. You can't get the same way in the book because they're yeah. literally telling that story. And I think it's very powerful. Um, and I, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see um, how mine does in that case, because I, I think my audio will do better 
in the physical, but you know, we will see. I, I think my voice is probably better than the written word, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited about recording it. Um, yeah, because that's right. I want to go on all these tangents that I didn't write in the books where I can be like, oh, this is what I really <laughs> meant here. Uh, so when your son did that, was it a, a hard ask to do that to, um, for him? Or was he like, did he pitch um, it? How'd that whole thing go down? No, I pitched it, but I said I could get it. You know, uh, Morgan James had said they could have a professional who does those kind of things, voiceovers or whatever, to do it. And I just kind of kept looking at the book and thinking, this is a very personal story I'm telling as stories. And I knew that he had the theater background, and I just said, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you did this for me. And he, I'd be curious when you get it, uh, Zach, and listen to it. Um, he did it all in one day, one take. And if you listen to it, it's remarkable. Only thing I would say from a, an author standpoint that it's a bit uh, stressful and frustrating is that, you know, when you're putting stuff on uh, Audible and iTunes and everything, Audible – they're terrific folks, but they're also very, very picky about what they <clears throat> what they'll have, you know, recorded and everything. So, getting the audio, I don't know whatever you want to call it, tolerances and everything in the right spot was a bit of a challenge. But I think you know went through some pain, but got a significant amount of gain when we got it. Uh, we like got a possible level. Yeah, and just different things like that. You're going to push me about. I can't remember all the details. Well, I just remember. Then there's, then there's like unabridged and abridged. So it's like exactly yeah. the copy, but then if you don't yeah. do the exact copy, you just got to tell them or then you can't yeah. have that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, it, it, but, but again, I mean, once we got it out there, I mean, it, it just has a great sound to it that your book's available in something other than print. I mean, and Kindle's great. And then you got an audio version that just, it kind of positions you even better, I think. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, um, I have a friend who did kind of one of my first videos um, who does stuff like that. And he's never done an audio book, but he, he's very much an audio technician and, and does really good with that. So uh, we're going to do that together. And uh, I think it's going to take me seven hours to read it. I'm also trying to do it in one day, but who, who knows? How, how many hours is is the read from an audio perspective? Do you remember? Gosh, not off the top of my head. I could probably look it up for it's you. Nine, oh. th for every 9,000 words, it's an hour. Oh, really? Okay. I think it's 40,000 words. Okay. So, so five hours ish. Yeah. Hmm. It goes by fast though, Zach. <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm reading principles by Ray Dalio right now and that's 16 hour read. Um, oh my goodness. Which is interesting. Uh, yeah. is, is book three on the way? Book three is going to come. It's, um, it's something I've thought about. I, um, got a lot of things in my head. I've, I've been doing you know, a significant amount of blogging and writing industry articles and things. And I've got, uh, it, it looks like I'm going to have the time to be able to, uh, to do that because, uh, but it'll be in 2019, probably the latter part rather than the front part, because um, in January, I'm turning my business, <clears throat> excuse me, over to my son to run day to day. Very cool. Um, Industry articles, industry groups and organizations, how do you get into them to get the impact that you want? Because it sounds like those have been good avenues for you to go into to get in front of more people. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you write those articles, I mean, we, we always try to position ourselves around here and in the industry is not just another audio visual video integrator. And, you know, it's all about the hardware, or whatever. We, we really try to position ourselves to be like thought leaders. And I tend to write like, you know, the way I'm very conversational and I've done it for years with this one publication and they, people seem to like it. They, they like the style. It's not real stilted. It's just very, uh, down to earth. And, uh, you know, so I kind of have, I know my, you know, where my uh, sweet spot is in terms of, uh, you know, the writing style and everything. And yeah, it's, it's absolutely enhanced our position in the industry big time. I love it. I'm a, I'm a big believer, I think I said this earlier, in relationship building, a big believer in reaching out and doing things that might be a little uncomfortable, saying hello to as many people as possible, even if you're just walking down the street saying hi to everyone that walks by. Not it, you know, not everyone's going to say hi back, but it, it's, it's, it's so powerful. Right. Like me, you know, reaching out and David saying that um, I should have you on or you should be on my show. Like, why is that strategy of building relationships 
so important to the growth of one's career? Oh, that's a, that's a pretty heavy question there. Um, you know, I think you are who you associate with. And I think with the relationships, uh, whether it be, you know, with David and the publishing end of it to other things, I think that, um, you, you are, uh, you know, the company that you keep and everything. And I think that when you nurture solid relationships, whether it be through publishing books and industry articles to get impact on people, I, you know, I think that it, at least for me, it's, it's, um, you know, establish a whole nother level of professionalism that I never even dreamed about having. Uh, it's just, it, it positions you better. And I think more, um, you know, in, in a professional manner, just way more than anything else you could do, you know, uh, as an example on something I'm talking about relationships, my business, we are a relationship company. Yeah, we sell technology, but we, honor the relationships we have with our customers, our suppliers, our employees. I think when you do that, it, 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 it's way more than a business. It, it's a, it's a, a way of doing things and a lifestyle and all that I think is really um, very rewarding and um, it, it's good. Do you remember when you bought jmyerceo.com what year? Uh, I think that was in either the end of 2013 or the first of 2014. So, I think it was 13 now. Okay. So <clears throat> you've had it for a, f a few years now. Do you, w was buying that and branding yourself, uh, did you see significant impact or growth from it instead of maybe, bec because if someone's listening and someone's watching and, and, and thinking about you, you really have two brands. You have the ISI brand, which is the bread and butter and basically what pays the bills. But then you have the Jay Myers brand. But it right. took you, what, seven, six or seven or eight years before you started branding that officially on the web. Like, did you see a significant growth because of that? Yes. I think that once we kind of were, the first book, we didn't really do that. And uh, we had a website for the book, but it was just kind of a passive thing. And I think once we branded with the, uh, the CEO site, it just positioned me in a whole bigger, better way. And it also drove book sales. I mean, it was, um, yeah, I think it definitely, um, and you know, the thing about it is Zach, I mean, I learned a lot from book one to two. So I, people say, God, it took him, you know, seven years or eight to write the second book. Well, I don't want to write and just to write, I want to have something to say. And by having something to say and, and, and meaningful content, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the whole thing. So, um, I thought that the story about, you know, growing a business during the recession after all that adversity was a story worth telling. In the case of the first book, you know, definitely uh, thought that, it, you know, overcoming adversity and the embezzlement and everything and identifying an issue, I thought, you know, again, had something to say. And I think that, um, you know, as time went on, every I learned a lot from that first book. I learned what did work in terms of marketing and promotion and positioning. And so we were ready. We had a lot of the questions answered when we went into book two, you know, and some of the plain vanilla meat and potato stuff about editing and things. You know, we got a, a professional editor. We had a professional PR person help us promote the book. We did get the website, you know, a lot of the collateral material. I mean, every to this day, I send out notes and people when I'm dropping books in the mail that have, you know, it's like a customized uh, stationery. So we, we learned a lot about the professional touches between the two books. <clears throat> I believe that everyone in whatever line of work that they do should try and today buy their uh, name website.com. So jmyers.com was not available is what it looks like, right? <clears throat> so for me, it's zachmillersays.com. Um, you know, the day that I get zachmiller.com will be a very, you know, very nice day. But it's so important yeah, you, because yeah. you have to brand yourself. But a lot of people are going to say you're being cocky for doing that. How do you respond to people saying that you're 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 promoting yourself? You're being cocky. You're 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 a chauvinist pig, even if you're not. But that's where a lot of people will go towards words associated with stuff like that by doing your own personal thing uh, in there. How do you? How do you kind of respond to that? 
Well, I mean, you know, you're going to always have people that will say things about you, that's for sure. But I, I think that, you know, if people understand marketing and understand what I was trying to do, I'll be dead honest with you, Zach. Part of the reason to write the first book, besides I had a story to tell, was that was step one of my exit uh, plan from my business. And I, I thought if I could get traction with that, get speaking engagements, do this, do that, I'd have another place I could take my take my game to, so to speak. Um, you know, in the case of the second book, when we got the Jay Meyer CEO thing done, I mean, it is a place that beyond, you know, I, I don't know if somebody would have thought it was egocentric or whatever. And I'm sure some people probably did, but it was also a place that I could continue to write by blogging and try, you know, and, 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 and communicate other things that came up beyond the book. So it's a marketing tool. And if people understand that, you know, that's certainly great. If they don't, you know, I don't know what I can do to tell them, you know, any differently. I mean, it just, um, can't please everyone. No, you can't. And if you, you keep trying, you know, you're going to drive yourself crazy. You just have to, you know, to, to see the, uh, the mission and what you're trying to get accomplished. And, you know, I, I mean, a lot of people in my industry are confused because I do run out and speak and all these things and the books and all that. It's like, is he an, is he an owner or is he an author? And what, what is he? And it's like, the answer is yes, both, you know, I mean, I don't have to be limited about one thing I can do. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I had that aha moment when I was meeting with David Hancock, um, in January of 18 and two, he said two things that I think were really interesting. Um, number one was that, uh, author is a derivative of the word authority. And so that was really, really interesting. And then I've been building up my business for a long time. And even though I was the face of it, and even though I was getting a lot of notoriety, I was building this business called Hatch. Still have it, whatever. But he said something on the lines of, people don't buy books from a business, they buy it from a person. And I was like, right. huh, that is interesting. And basically at that moment, I was like, okay, I have to start building you know, the actual Zach Miller brand and brand it with my name on it. Where before, for the last decade, even though I was a part of it, I am now building my name instead of the business name, um, which is a completely different game than, than what I had done before. So um, it took me a lot longer to buy that domain than you did. So um, mm -hmm. what's something about you that I haven't talked about that or that we haven't talked about that you want people to know about? Um... Great question. The um, things that uh, people don't know about me. Um, well, this is very personal. I have a crippling fear of heights. <laughs> I don't like getting into high places, so don't invite me to a mountaintop to do anything. I, I don't do that kind of stuff well. Hmm. What floor uh, is your office on? <laughs> it's a ground floor. Okay. <laughs> uh, but is no, that... you know, other than that, I mean, you know, I, I enjoy a lot of things. I have a lot of interest. And so, you know, the whether it be sports and golf and baseball and these kind of things and traveling and uh, I don't know, you know, for, for other people that uh, another answer might be uh, <laughs> this is a fun one related to baseball. I uh, because of my fantasy camps that I've done with the Yankees, um, I have a house in Florida, a second house, about an hour from the stadium. So that's kind of fun. I don't know if everybody knows that, but uh, some do. So, you know, those kind of things. Very cool. So the fear of heights, so no roller coasters, you hate flying stuff like that. You know, flying does not bother me at all. I don't know why. So I think it's just more of, you know, it's, it's all in my head, but, um, <clears throat> probably a more, uh, you know, maybe if we, we if you want to edit, then we can nix that part of it out. Um, something that people don't know about me is I, I, I came from a very big family, seven kids, two parents. And so, um, you know, growing up in a big Catholic family and everything, uh, some of us didn't get to know each other very well, but a lot of people don't realize I came from such a big family. How big is your family now? You have two kids? So you two kids. Yeah. But I took the easy way out. My dad and my mother and father, uh, God rest their souls. They, they had a whole lot more to deal with. Hmm. What's next for you? Well, I'm actually getting uh, very involved with uh, the local university, the University of Memphis. I'm an alum, and I am uh, getting momentum into my new position at the University of Memphis, where I'm uh, the executive in residence there. 
And so for the near term, I'm going to be out there conducting workshops, teaching Toastmaster classes, that kind of stuff, and putting on uh, startup uh, festivals and things for them to encourage the the students in the business school at the University of Memphis, the Fogelman College, to, you know, go chase their dreams. And if they had a dream about entrepreneurship and owning their own thing, you know, I'm a guy that's been through it, and I'd be happy to help you. And uh, we're putting together some other resources in uh, the near future for the, to help them as well. Very cool. Penny Hardaway is now the coach there, too, in basketball, right? That is correct. People pumped up about that in Memphis? Oh, he, oh yeah, very much so. Um, Have you met him? I have not met Penny, but I, I know his assistant, Mike Miller, who has a couple of world championships rings uh, from the Cavs and the Heat when he played with LeBron. Right. Uh, I've, I've gotten to be very good friends with Mike. I've known him for probably 10 or 12 years and really excited about having him on the staff. So uh, kind of kind of neat for the University of Memphis to have two guys that have NBA uh, experience and championships and all-star games. and uh, teams and everything uh, going out recruiting players so we're excited last question so if someone is trying to learn more about you to create a relationship with you what's the best way to get in touch with you well i'm very active on social media um so you can find me on linkedin uh twitter at, at jb myers uh i don't even mind giving my email address it's the letter j m y e r s at I S I T N like Tennessee.com. Uh, either of the, any of those places. I mean, I, I, I'm good about returning messages. Hey everyone. Thanks so much for listening to this entire episode of Zach Miller says it was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions or guests that you want to ask me or see me on the show, hit me up. You can just do it in the comments or email me, Z-A-C-K. That's me at startwithhatch.com. So Zach, Z-A-C-K at S-T-A-R-T-W-I-T-H-H-A-T-C-H dot com. Now my good friend Eric Olson is encouraging me to do these out cues, right? Usually when you're listening to these, the show just kind of ends abruptly. Why? Because it's weird and that's what anomalies do. But he really thinks that I should be upselling This bad boy, my brand new book, Anomaly, how to finally stand out from the crowd. Now, officially, the book comes out April 2nd of 2019. However, I've advanced copies. And if you want one of these bad boys, you can go to ZachMillerSays.com slash Anomaly. That's A-N-O-M-A. L-Y, or just check out the link in the show notes and you can get your advanced copy of the greatest book ever written, produced, and whatever other exciting word to describe it could be. I really appreciate you guys continuing to listen to the show, though. Uh, it means a lot to me. We've done hundreds of episodes. I really want to tell the stories of people, um, be very transparent in my solo episodes, my long-form interviews with people, trying to get stories that most people have not been able to get out of them. I think that's something that's super powerful and really provides great content. I love the stories that I'm telling of, of the people that I interview. And then I also, you know, with these solo episodes, just really try to talk through and document what I'm currently going through. And so I appreciate you guys listening. Hey, and also one last thing after you grab the book, like cheesy plug for the book here, ah, after you get the book, Make sure you subscribe to the show, and if you have a friend or following that you think would also enjoy the episode, share it with them as well, because the more people that consume this, the more lives that we together can change. Ooh, look at that. Grab a book. Thank you all. Peace.